good day. I'm Dr. Charles Dedham. I'm chairman of TMIT Global and one of the co-founders of the MedTech Bystander Rescue Care Program. I'll be both a speaker and your moderator today. We're so very blessed you're joining us to learn how to keep your family safe. So we're really delighted to be starting today. We always start our programs with a voice of the patient. Jennifer Dingman is a longstanding patient safety contributor. She and a morning team on Saturday mornings ha have established uh, a number of initiatives. And one was a grassroots effort that helped the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, uh, pa pass and put into action a pay for performance program uh, in hospitals that led to hundreds of thousands of lives saved and tens of billions of dollars. She's been a co-author on numerous papers and has been on committees representing patients. And we're delighted to have Jennifer, who has been our voice of the, the patient for this program throughout its entirety. Jennifer, would you please uh, set our compass heading today for today's program? Thank you, Dr. Denham, and thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to today's webinar. Everything that I, I have learned so much from these webinars with everything that they're teaching us regarding the COVID virus and what we need to do. Um, looking forward to the future now that um, America is getting vaccinated and we're getting back to normal, but we still have to be cautious. There are variants out there and there's just so much more to learn. And hopefully this experience will teach us and prepare us for the future to where something like this will never happen again in history. Dr. Denham and his team have provided so much valuable information and for the public and for other groups that are helping the public. And I just wanna thank everyone here today who's here today and who has been here in the past for being here. Please share the recording of this webinar with your family members, friends, colleagues, and anyone else that you would like to share it with. And um, again, I'm going to hand it back to you, Dr. Denham. I'm looking forward to today's program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks for your steadfast support and uh, terrific work in the past. Um, it's, it's just a delight to be working with you and we look forward to rounding out this series and we'll continue with it as long as we need to. And that's, what, that's where the slide that I'm showing right now actually came from just this week. It was from yesterday from uh, IHME, probably the leading forecasters of the impact of the COVID-19, both as infections uh, and deaths around the world. And you can see that we uh, were delighted to have a reduction in the daily deaths globally. But as you can see, um, there are forecasted potential uh, risk uh, coming forward. I always call myself a recovering optimist on the wagon of reality. My hope is that we won't have another surge here in the United States, but but you can see that we really are seeing variant surges around the world. And with many countries who have not been vaccinated, even though we're lagging behind where we really want to be, and we hope that we won't have a, a variant surge here in the United States. This being a global webinar, we want to acknowledge so many of you from 194 countries around the world that uh, are experiencing a pretty terrific uh, impact by uh, COVID-19. So this is uh, uh, the forecast is of yesterday. Uh, today, we're going to cover 10 principles. What we'd like to do uh, is give you the 10 best practices for reopening, but we've got to cover some topics that will really give you the grounding uh, in why these best practices are the best practices. Uh, 10 principles, we'll go through 10 principles that are absolutely critical, and then we'll cover the 10 best practices. And we're delighted to have this group of speakers and reactors to address them. So I won't review them and read the slide for you, but I want you to see how uh, much of the, uh, the work in the best practices for reopening has to be anchored in the science that we already know. We're delighted to have Dr. Gregory Boats, who will be a speaker for each of uh, almost all of the best all of the best practices and most of the principles. Unfortunately, he's in the ICU taking care of patients today. I've given you a brief bio uh, of of uh, uh, of Dr. Boats, who's been a wonderful contributor and a co-founder of the MedTech Bystander Rescue Care Program. He's also the chief medical officer for the police department, led by 
Chief Adcox, who I'd like to uh, ask to just comment. And uh, Chief Adcox, uh, you, not only are you an award-winning security leader, but you're also um, really a pathfinder in the area of threat safety science. And we know that this program is being used for continuing education for both clinicians as well as families, but also for first responders. Uh, let me on behalf of all of us, thank you as our representative of first responders and the professional leaders of being uh, an educator, you are one, first responder, you lead the first responders, and you're also representative of the safety and quality of care at MD Anderson Hospital and Cancer Center. So uh, we just wanna thank you. You're kind of wear three hats all the time and we just like to have your message to uh, the first responders and families of first responders. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, the, the most important thing that I'd like to say uh, is, is not just for the first responders, but for all of us, you know, we just need to make sure that we are very, very careful and we don't let our guard down. We need to stay true to our prevention actions, the things that we're doing every day. Um, first responders need to work to 10 principles. We need to continue to, to drill those, to work through those, make sure that that's an important part of us. And lastly, that they need to continue to learn. Uh, this is a, the, the, there's a lot to be learned and a lot to be uh, found we don't know yet. And so this is a serious issue. Uh, yes, it's, uh, thankfully we're turning the corner, uh, but we need to keep our vigilance up. I mean, we need to learn and we need to work the 10 principles. And that would be the main message I would have for, for our first responders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. And uh, Heather Foster would just like to express to her fellow nurses, caregivers, pharmacists, allied care personnel, how grateful that we are uh, for you all carrying the load uh, on behalf of our country. And hopefully we won't have another surge, but uh, uh, we would be remiss in not, not acknowledging uh, so many of the frontline caregivers that go way beyond the doctors, physicians, but also the EMS providers and the whole continuity of care. She asked me to share that message with you. You'll hear from David Besh here in a moment, but he also is representing the educators. And I know we have a lot of teachers and families of teachers. Uh, and David, when we get to your portion, I'd like to have you just express your thoughts in addition to why it is so important that we have chief family officers and leaders of our families as we go forward. And so we'll ask you to do that, David, as we uh, move forward. I'm really delighted to have uh, Jamie Iristoris alive with us today. As I said, he is a uh, now a medical student at the University of Nebraska. He's done a terrific job in much of the core content that we've pulled together, and he'll be able to speak live as well as Paul uh, Batia, who has been a steadfast supporter of this program a global speaker with Jamie on a number of our programs as well. I'm going to give you a chance to see the kind of work and the great work that they've done and sh uh, share a couple of video clips and actually have them comment. And my son, who's just graduating uh, from his uh, freshman year in high school, you'll also hear from him, although he's not available today as well. When we look back at our MedTAC program, and just to give you a little bit of historical context, uh, we put, the, put together the, the MedTAC is the combination of medical best practices and tactical best practices. We wouldn't be where we are today if we hadn't started with these uh, five, six, almost six years ago, these Cub Scouts on the right, where we experimented with the concept of could we teach them CPR um, and uh, the Stop the Bleed program from the universe, from the uh, American College of Surgeons, but we wouldn't be where we are today without uh, having Mr. David Besh, the award-winning teacher who took the chance of starting to teach this, and we've been teaching this as uh, a program in schools after school programs, uh, as well as uh, uh, school programs in, in the summer. And Mr. Beshk actually, after learning one of the techniques on a Thursday, saved the first life of uh, MedTech, of which just in the school where it was started, we've had three lives saved. MedTech is focused on the eight leading causes of preventable death from emergencies. These are preventable deaths that bystanders or good Samaritans can weigh in on before EMS arrives. What, the question is, what can you do in the 10 minutes before EMS arrives? That's what we've been teaching in MedTech. And then when coronavirus uh, crisis struck, we focused on what you see there as infection care is one of those practices. 
We've also been blessed to be able to write a number of Campus Safety Magazine articles, uh, which, you, which we'll have posted on the website. Uh, the most recent actually addresses family safety plans during the COVID environment, and you'll hear, uh, you'll be able to reference that. So for those of you that are joining us for the first time, uh, who is the T TMIT Global? Um, I started uh, uh, TMIT 37 years ago uh, when I was in I just left uh, my training and moved into practice in Austin, Texas. Over that period of time, it has grown to, um, to leaders uh, that are in 3,000 communities at 3,100 hospitals. Uh, we have 500 subject matter experts that over the years have contributed. Uh, not one of them has been paid. Every one of them has contributed their time and energy for these free programs. And as you heard, we've put on now, this is our 163rd month in a row that we've put on these programs. When the crisis hit in, in New York City and in Italy, we began, folk, we realized where can our small nonprofit organization do the most good that would not be duplicative? And we decided that could be with the families of the essential workers. When we went into lockdown, the people that had to work no matter what, and you see the 16 industry sectors that were declared by the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Then in June, June 18th of 2020, as you see on the left, educators, all educators from, uh, from preschool all the way through to technical services as well as educational services were declared by Homeland Security to be essential workers. And we're so grateful to have Mr. Bashk and Chief Adcox and Dr. Boats, uh, all of your speakers, in fact, uh, in one way or another, are educators and would, all, would fall in that category. What we did was we started off by producing short videotapes that could help families and essential workers and first responders and rapidly grew to an entire program now of 12 survive and thrive courses, which you can find on our web uh, site. And we're curating and continuing to update content. However, the science is changing faster than we can even curate it. However, you can go on our website of uh, www.medtechglobal.org and you can view any of the material that was created. We started with 60 subject matter experts. It's now grown to over 100 subject matter experts that participate with us. They come from all areas. They're as, they're as young as uh, seven or eight years of age from uh, schools as well as scouting groups to uh, uh, people in their 80s. Uh, and they also include a number of experts who we interviewed for two Discovery Channel films that you see at the bottom of this slide. On the right is one of our next documentaries. We've got three documentaries in the pipeline. Likely um, this third will be with the Discovery Channel or one of the other main, main streaming uh, entities. Uh, the first was Chasing Zero, Winning the War on Healthcare Harm. The second was Surfing the Healthcare Tsunami, Bring Your Best Board. And this third will be three minutes and counting. What can we do as good Samaritans in those first three minutes from drop to shock for cardiac arrest or for ma massive trauma and bleeding? And you see a number of experts and contributions from uh, some wonderful people that include astronauts, former assistant secretaries of health, Sully Sullenberger, who performed the miracle on the Hudson, Jim Collins, and uh, my dear friend and late partner, uh, Professor Christensen from, uh, from Harvard. And you also see speakers from today. What's most exciting to me most recently is we have now uh, over 30 college uh, students, alumni, and faculty members that are focused on driving um, down vaccine hesitancy through a program that you'll hear more about here in a few minutes. And these are a number of our students that are all donating their time to help drive down uh, the hesitancy for, uh, for vaccination. So we're going to cover 10 principles and 10 best practices today. Uh, the best, the 10 best practices, as you see, are arranged around what we call the four Ps, which are prevention, preparedness, protection and performance improvement. And Chief Adcox, I'd love for you to help us understand the concept of left of boom, meaning um, how can we prevent something, the bad event from happening, but we're talking about prevention, which is primary prevention of getting infected. Secondary prevention is reducing the harm perhaps of infection. Preparedness is getting ready if somebody were to get sick, test positive, need quarantine, need isolation. And then protection is doggone it, somebody got sick, now what are we gonna do about emergency care, providing care at home, and then what we, do we do through recovery if someone gets long haul disease? And then at the new normal, what can we do at the new normal? 
So let's talk about the 10 principles of family transmission chains. And as we look at the family transmission chains, they impact virtually every single one of the topics that we covered in our Survive and Thrive Guide as we look, uh, as we look at the, what we call the four Ps. We'd like everybody to be thinking, how can we prevent? How can we prepare when it happens? What do we do to protect our loved ones and ourselves when we care for them? And then what can we learn? What can we learn now, the year after this, uh, this issue has, uh, has uh, presented itself? And it looks like I, my slide is stumbling there for a minute. So I'll refocus it. Okay, so the first is family transmission chains. What are they? Well, we our hypothesis was that uh, was that you weren't just catching it at work as an essential worker, but you could catch it at school, home, and uh, our most vulnerable people could uh, could catch this through their families. Now we have studied over 1,000 family responses, and family is a loose definition. It could include our college students that are on today to speak, who might be living with roommates, but from our study of, a, of over a thousand, uh, it confirmed to us, as well as many of the medical papers, that family transmission chains are the problem. It's the Achilles heel. It continues to be the Achilles heel. And the best thing we can do is to be able to stop these uh, family transmission chains and block them at the source. If we save the families, we can save the worker. If we save the worker, we can save the nation. So it's, it, we, we didn't have the data when we started um, that we do today that a huge amount of spread is through asymptomatic spreaders. They may never get the disease, but they may infect their loved ones who then go back to work and then end up with a positive test. So we can save families across communities if we focus on the family. So as we look at uh, this topic, I'm going to be playing um, uh, short clips from Dr. Boats, Heather Foster, and uh, I will show some clips of Jamie Uristorsa and Paul Abatia, uh, and then have them speak as well. So let's listen, from doc listen to Dr. Boats right now. So Dr. Boats, as we think about smart reopening, uh, now more than a year after we started our community of practice, what are your thoughts regarding family transmission chains, the spread through families? I think it's very important to understand that family transmission chains has been such an important aspect of uh, viral spread in our communities. And as we move from an acute phase where we had lots of cases to now perhaps a maintenance phase or a lessening phase as we move to reopening, it's still important to consider that family transmission chains can exist and can continue to move the virus through our communities. So I said, as I said, Heather Foster uh, could not be on. She's on duty today in a hospital. She practices as a nurse. She's been a nurse prevention practitioner, but she's also helped us uh, tremendously uh, in the, at the front line in developing what's necessary uh, to manage this disease in our communities outside of the major medical centers. Family transmission trains are even more important than what we thought before. And, and primarily because uh, if we bring that virus home to our children, who we know are going to be our biggest um, spreaders, uh, that, that's, that's the main reason why we, we got to definitely break the chain within our family circles. They're going to be out in the community. They're going to be asymptomatic carriers and, and unbeknownstly carry these uh, viruses to, to those who are susceptible. So as we think about these family transmission chains, uh, everything that we're focused on, we must we must remember that uh, that we need to vaccinate not only uh, ourselves but also vaccinate our families. It's absolutely critical uh, that we do so. So let's hear it from Dr. Boats about as we look at vaccinations now, and we're delighted to have such wonderful leaders from many of our top universities and alumni and faculty. As we look at vaccination of families, your message to families, uh, essential workers and the general public regarding vaccination. I think it's very important for families to consider full vaccination for all of the members of their family and their extended family. I think it's really important to promote uh, everyone you know in your circle to get vaccinated so that it will help reduce the spread of the coronavirus in our communities. 
so one of the the third principle is don't share the air. This is uh, this is critical because what we've realized uh, over the last year and a half uh, is that it's absolutely vital that we understand that the major spread route is through asymptomatic and symptomatic people and not on contact surfaces uh, so much, although they are really important, but we need to be able to, to focus on the fact that uh, there are both large droplets and small aerosol droplets that can hang in the air that are absolutely critical. So let's hear what from Dr. Boats on, on that. Dr. Boats says uh, we have learned so much more about the spread of the virus uh, we're using the expression, don't share the air because of the aerosol risk. And now what we know about the spread, any comments you'd like to add to that? I think that's critically important for us to emphasize that aerosol spread is a major factor in the spread of this virus. So by using a clever statement like don't share the air, we emphasize that trying to reduce our exposure by reducing time in closed spaces uh, with poor ventilation is a very important strategy to reduce uh, transmission. So what I'd like to do now is, uh, is, is share with you our great experience working with our students. Jamie Erstorsa, I've given you his bio, has helped us with uh, the work in, the, in masks. Uh, he's also helped us uh, with our continuing medical education program for University of Texas uh, uh, programs as well. We're really delighted to have him work with us. And now an incoming medical student uh, is really armed with the knowledge and the critical uh, uh, information that is, is, uh, is important. Jamie, can you share with us uh, your uh, experience in learning about aerosol uh, risk and what, what we know today that we didn't know when we started with uh, COVID? Yes, I would say that um, aerosol risk is something that I really didn't know very much about before starting on our research projects. And it's actually very important to understand the mechanism of aerosol risk because it really makes you understand why the measures that we we'll put in place that we encourage like uh, wearing masks and don't share the air, why those are so, so important to preventing the spread of the virus. Fantastic. And I think you and I had uh, the, the dilemma of the science was changing so rapidly. And when 239 scientists wrote to the WHO and said, you must, must focus on aerosol risk, it took them many months to finally declare that it was the biggest risk. And so now we really need to put on our, our thinking cap and say, wait a minute, maybe some of the energy that we focused on contact, high contact surfaces needs to be really focused on ventilation and HVAC systems. Um, uh, Paul, Love to get your take on this uh, in your perspective as an EMT uh, and as someone that is uh, dealing with this uh, challenge and caring for other people at the front line. Absolutely. So um, it's definitely important to understand the risks behind the aerosols, um, but also uh, even though our vaccination progress is, is continuing, it's, it's still incredibly important that we all continue um, the best practices for ourselves and our families, such as face masking, and, and social distancing when we're out and about, especially in crowded, dense areas. Fantastic. And I think it's really, really uh, critical that we keep wearing the masks. Wouldn't you guys say that masks are just as important as they were until this virus burns out as we think about our immune compromised patients, of which there are a huge proportion, and, and others. And so it really isn't a political issue. It's just basic science. Wouldn't you both agree? Absolutely. Yes. Masks are still very important. Uh, we've We've learned a lot about COVID since the beginning of the outbreak. And I think the evidence is clear on the aerosolization of this virus. So the masks are huge mitigators of that, of, of, of spreading the virus to other people. So as we reopen, I think it's important that we continue to use our masks, especially amongst those who um, are not vaccinated yet. So uh, our next uh, principle is, to turn science into safety. Our focus has uh, been on learning, well, what are the public health guidelines that keep changing very dramatically? And God bless them, they are having to change the guidelines uh, more and more rapidly because the science is exploding. However, they're giving us the what. And our programs and the 12 programs that we've now generated uh, are the how. So what we try to do is put the meat into the how of, of what uh, those topics might be. Let's listen to, let's, uh, listen to Dr. Boats regarding, uh, regarding this issue. 
Dr. Boats, as we think about uh, the CDC and, and uh, uh, our local public health organizations putting out guidelines, we like to say that they provide us the what and that we are providing the how, converting the science into safety and then hopefully safe success. Thoughts there? I think it's so important for us to take the information that is shared by the public health agencies and by our scientific community and try to figure out how people can actually operationalize that in their daily lives. How can they take the science and the knowledge that's being spread by our, our leading agencies and actually make it work for ourselves, for our families, and for our communities? It's been wonderful working with uh, Mr. David Bashk, who I've uh, introduced earlier, uh, as we look at the CDC guidelines are changing continually and still changing regarding kids in schools, and uh, it, it, it makes it very confusing and hard to follow. Um, David Bashk uh, actually helped us, uh, helped us understand um, uh, why it was so important uh, that, we, uh, that we have uh, our family members uh, be led by a safety leader. And uh, uh, David, what I'd like for you to do is really uh, address this issue uh, of the chief family officer uh, with whom you work with all the time as an educator uh, of young children and why this is so critically important. Can you share with us this concept of the family CFO? Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Denham. Um, as an educator who, uh, part of my role isn't just educating children, it's educating families, it's educating the adults on ways that we can be more effective as a team to work together to um, help everyone feel better and learn. And the, the CFO I find is a critical component within the family in all areas of life, but especially with right now with what's going on. Um, as you mentioned a minute ago, Dr. Denham, that the, the, the numbers and the policies and, the, and all of the regulations, everything's changing so quickly. So, and that can, for especially for young children can create a lot of confusion. And when there's confusion, you get a lot of um, a lot of high emotions, and you get you get just a, a lot of things that inhibit um, the family's uh, ability to work, function, and and work well together. In in my from my perspective, the CFO, especially in times like today, with with the ever changing um, landscape of of coronavirus, th their main role is to create um, a sense of calm and a sense of predictability within the family and sharing information. Um, and it's not just top down. I think a CFO, their, their main job is to be a good listener and to listen to the emotions and the questions, and the ideas that the rest of the family may have, take that into consideration um, and do their best to keep everybody up to date, to keep their plans up to date, to make sure that everybody um, falls back on their training, which should always be current and information should be as current as possible. Uh, the CFO plays a, a very important role within the community, especially within their household, to create a sense of certainty, a sense of calmness, and um, to be making sure that everyone's kept abreast with what information they need to be safe. Thank you, David. And uh, you you worked on a very rapid response uh, uh, project uh, with Charlie uh, Denham. Uh, focused on being the family lifeguard when we saw this enormous surge in th over Thanksgiving and then heading toward the holidays. Uh, and uh, uh, you all were able to communicate, I believe, very well to young people, as well as uh, uh, scouts and Girl Scouts and uh, children, how they could actually play the role as the family lifeguard. Uh, I wanted you just to maybe reframe uh, that. I, th I thought it was, uh, it, it, it was uh, probably one of the best examples of responding within hours of a challenge and then moving forward and maybe why it's still applicable today because we don't have everybody vaccinated and we still got a significant risk. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, 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 really, I'm really proud of, of this aspect and I'm glad that you um, included it today that, um, you know, it, I think we oftentimes um, overlook the importance and the value that um, children can play in the family, especially in situations like this, where you give them a sense of ownership, you give them um, some leadership and some responsibility within the family unit, especially when you have large gatherings, um, now that summer's opening up and with the holiday season and all of those things that they can be eyes and ears that, you know, oftentimes adults get busy and we lose sight of, of, of safety protocols and we lose sight of, of distancing and sharing of, of materials. 
Um, and by giving giving children, and even as young as five years old, I have my my preschooler who I um, I made one of the the family lifeguards over um, over the holiday season, and we recently had some some friends in town and. They were vital and just, hey, daddy, don't forget to, to, you know, we're not sharing utensils. Hey, daddy, make sure to keep the window open in the bathroom. And you give them, you give them those opportunities, you train them appropriately, and they, they can be incredibly important um, uh, lifeguards and members of our family to keep everybody safe. Thank you, David. And I know you've got demands uh, uh, where you're working today and taking the time. But um, as we move through the, the reopening, and we move back to the eight leading causes of death that are just critical emergencies. We now have hesitancy to be good Samaritans. You've just done a terrific job of teaching fifth graders, and we've taught everybody from third graders to from eight from eight to eighty. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the the broader CPR, stop the bleed program uh, for trauma, and and our our broader program. Can you just leave us with the message on how critical it is? Since you saved the first life within, lear you learned a technique on a Thursday and saved a life on a Saturday. How vital! It is that we all become good Samaritans and, and not be reluctant to help others and, and, and use some of the protective mechanisms so we actually can help others and loved ones. Well, absolutely. I mean, look at it for obvious reasons, you know, uh, coronavirus is, is kind of in the spotlight of, of, of what's going on, but we still have people getting injured. You still have people in, in need of CPR. You still have massive trauma. Obviously, we see with the shootings going on around the country. Um, these eight leading causes, it's it's imperative because, you know, like you said, Dr. Denham, we have we have those critical moments before emergency personnel can get there. And I think, as you know well, one of the greatest messages that um, MedTAC preaches is that just because you you understand how to do something doesn't mean that you have to do it, but you could teach it to other people. And so being able to have those skills and the confidence to maybe not put your hands on somebody, but to be able to say, hey, I can teach you what to do. And that's why we go as young as eight and even younger to five years old, right? Teach how to put your hands in the center of the chest and push hard and fast because those people, children and young adults and anybody, you can be a teacher. It's, it's the all learn, all teach model. And we can't forget about the other aspects of safety and our role and our importance as being first responders oftentimes to these critical emergencies. And you have these short windows that our, our defining moments and we have to be able to step in and we have to be able to, to, to provide that care and bridge that gap between um, from job to shock. Well, listen, thank you so much, David. And thank you. Uh, you're our re representative of, of, te of our teachers and the younger age group. And we just want to thank you and thank you for helping all the teachers that may be on today. Thank you uh, for all. And we're so grateful to all of you for taking the risk of taking care of our kids. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Well, thank you very much. And to all the teachers out there, this 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 information at first may seem overwhelming and may seem, you know, 30,000 feet, but it's really not. You just got to get in there, get your hands dirty, and you're going to find how how rewarding and how interesting and how fun it is to to share this with not just yourself and your colleagues, but with with your students. So I encourage you to um, to get involved and 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 take that first step. It, it's it's rewarding. Thank you, David. Yes, sir. Have a nice day. So from Dr. Boats, as we look at organizations down at the family unit level or large organizations or medium-sized organizations, private, public, nonprofit, we really believe that there, it's critical that we have a leader, somebody who takes a safety plan uh, by the horns and actually make sure that when it's designed and followed through. Your comments there. You're absolutely right. It is so important that we have someone or some group focused on the safety of our organizations, including our families, in order to maintain the attention, the diligence to our safety practices to keep everyone safe. Dr. Boats, as we now are going into our reopening phase, many people are not only shedding their masks and social distance, but they may also shed the idea of employing the five R's, which we've put together, that having the family safety plan or corporate safety plan. Your comments regarding that as we look at reopening. Well, it really is encouraging that the numbers of cases and the number of hospitalizations and certainly the number of deaths are decreasing. That's very favorable. However, 
I think it's important to maintain our focus on the five R's in order to reduce the risk of transmission. Remember the vaccinations are only 95% effective at best. That means that up to 5% of people will be infected. They may not get sick. They may not need hospitalization, but they certainly can infect others. And until we get a higher level of vaccination in our communities, we are still at risk of passing the same very serious viral illness to others who don't have the protection from having had vaccination. Using the five R's is a critical approach. Perhaps we adjust it to our current context, but still having the same attention to the five R's is critical to our response. So as we talk about these five R's, uh, and you just heard from Dr. Boats regarding them. What are they? And those of you that are dialing in for the first time, and most of you will have be seeing this on demand, please go to our website and you can watch uh, our programs on how to build a patient safety plan or a family safety plan, how to implement it. We have templates. We have a number of assets available uh, to you. So let's just review them quickly. So the first of R is readiness to be ready. And if we look at the plans um, and we look at, at the these topics, the five R's are really spelled out as a cycle. And the reason we spell them out and we use the idea of a cycle is the plans are constantly updated. We must constantly be updating our readiness, response, rescue, recovery, and resilience. So as we look at those, what's readiness? Readiness is preparation, regular review, and updating of a plan based on the latest science regular deliberate practice of the roles and skills each member uh, may undertake. Um, when we think about response, what's response? Response is the family moves to action to respond to an emergency. The safeguards are put in place. This might be a, a member might be infected or exposed. This can still happen, although we're dropping so many of the required uh, precautions and guidelines, we still have many, many people that have not been vaccinated. We have many people that are what's called immune compromised, meaning their immunity is down. They could get infected. And uh, we also have uh, around the world, many, many countries uh, where the, the variants are raging. And now that travel will be opened up, um, we are at risk of these variants coming uh, to us here. So what's rescue? Well, rescue is the regular and deliberate practice of the roles and skills to take somebody, a loved one or a friend or a colleague to the emergency department if they have severe sy symptoms. This means having records and medications ready to go with the patient. And also what's really critical because of aerosol risk, windows down, masks, any way that you can move without sharing the air, we now know uh, today in 2021, much more important than we ever thought it was. And I've got no, a number of stories, uh, I wouldn't use the names, but a number of stories of people that caught the disease in cars, uh, in sharing, uh, sharing transportation. And then what about recovery? And recovery uh, is uh, this issue of the family recovering, but long haulers, those that develop these long-term symptoms are an enormous group. We're seeing more and more of it. Uh, it was estimated at, what, at one time 10%, some estimate 20%. Some say that there are long-term symptoms that are even a bigger fraction and percentage of people. So as we look at this recovery, it's really important that we uh, be ready uh, to take care and, and learn uh, through the recovery process so that we know that we can, uh, uh, we can get back to what we call uh, the new normal. So these are the five R's. We've covered them in our prior through our Survive and Thrive Guide courses, and we, we hope that you would, uh, you would see those. Now, resilience is the last R. What is resilience? Well, resilience is fortifying your response, learning from what's gone on for, rest, for response rescue and recovery in the plan. We've learned so much now uh, uh, about what uh, law enforcement and what Chief Adcox would use as a term, target hardening. How do we harden the target of our family unit or our company or our, uh, or our learning unit to be, to be able to be safe? Okay, so enough for the, for the principles. Now we can move rapidly through the best practices. Let's talk about the vaccines. And as we look at these, and we look at our Survive and Thrive Guide courses, they map beautifully to prevention, preparedness, protection, and performance improvement. 
And you can go on our website and watch any of these 90 minute programs and we'll continue to curate the content and update the content to make it, uh, to make it able to be, uh, uh, to be functional. And we look forward to you uh, being able to watch those. So uh, now let's talk about uh, uh, the vaccines. Uh, we've started a program called Take the Shot, Save a Life, led by the students, two of which are on, uh, on our, our program today. This is a program to drive down hesitancy in multiple groups, in high schoolers, college groups, but families. The movable middle are not those that are definitely uh, against vaccination, which are estimated to only be maybe 10 to 15% of the population. The movable middle need answers and access. And uh, so an article that just came out yes or yesterday um, in Vox was really excellent and articulated not only the message, but the studies that lack of access of real or perceived is still a problem, even though we hear that there's so many places to go. Many people do not see COVID-19 as a threat because it hasn't impacted their own families. And there's so much misinformation out on the web uh, about this. Lack of trust in the vaccines. They were developed so rapidly and many do not understand the long and arduous work that was undertaken to develop the mRNA uh, methodology, which is so critical to the Pfizer and uh, the Moderna vaccines. There are a lack of trust in the institutions, the, the, our government institutions with much, uh, a, a lot of misinformation out on the web. And then there are these uh, variety of conspiracy theories. I really recommend that you read this article. It's free, you can get it on the web. And it was really, really well done. So we put together about six weeks ago, the Take the Shot, Save a Life program uh, and helping students uh, be able to uh, have the vaccination conversation. Why vaccinate? Why you and why now? And the vaccination conversation can be shared with adults, anybody who might be in that movable middle. And we're guiding students, our, our students, two of which are on our program today, are the coaches of high school students and other college students. They're, they represent a number of our leading universities. The what's in it for the high school students are, this is where they can have a real um, connection with people like Jamie Aristorsa, uh, who's going to medical school, and Paul Batia, who will go to medical school, and be able to talk to college students that can help them understand what's going on. And our students from these leading organizations, we're mentoring to help them with their uh, advanced degrees and, and where they will go with the research and work. We now have 30 and the group that you see before you are the original group uh, for whom we have short video clips addressing a number of the issues. So what we did was put the vaccination conversation video together, but then each one of these individuals has tackled two or three or even more of the topics to be able to give a message student to student, college student to or scientist to, uh, to high school student. And we're really blessed to have them have put together these FAQs. We're starting to deploy it now in some pilot sites and we'll be taking it to scale very rapidly. So we're delighted to have Paul Batia, who you've been introduced to earlier, uh, and Jamie Aristorsa, uh, both um, uh, uh, involved in this. And I'm going to uh, ask them to comment, but I'm going to show uh, two clips of these excellent uh, uh, young men. So there are a lot of myths out there. Some people think that. There we go. And we start with Paul and then we'll go to Jamie and then we'll go to. So there are a lot of myths out there. Some people think that the vaccines give them COVID. Some people even think that they, they get sterile after getting vaccinated. And some people even think that the vaccines come with some sort of microchip or device. I'm here to tell you that there is no evidence for any of that. So I would say we are currently in a really important point in the pandemic. And if you look at the data, we can tell to your own health as well as to the public health, there's no reason to wait. So I would encourage all of you to have the conversations, to look at the data, to share the information that you know, and encourage everybody to get this vaccine as soon as possible. There's really no reason to wait. I hope you guys all get vaccinated to see the lives of your family. So Jamie, would you like to kind of comment on this particular project in focusing on the vaccines, the hesitancy group, and your message to our broader audience of families of first responders uh, and uh, essential workers? I'm sorry, Dr. Dan, can you repeat the question? I'm having some trouble with my internet. I, I think you broke up there for a second. 
So Jamie, would you please uh, express your message to the first responder families, essential worker families and our broader, broader audience of the general public uh, regarding this program to our young people, but what your message might be to everyone regarding vaccination? Yeah, so I think in, we were talking about the 10 best practices for reopening. I would say the vaccines are probably the easiest one to implement and maybe the one that will give the most results the quickest to all of us. So if you know people that are hesitant about getting the vaccine, I would really encourage you to share information with them because we might not trust governments and we might not trust social media or institutions, but I do believe that people still might trust their friends. Um, so I really am very excited about this opportunity um, and this uh, uh, Take the Shot, Save a Life program, because I really think that the work we're going to be doing, especially in young people's lives, is going to be hugely impactful to the public health, and it's going to have great results towards my generation who really needs to get the vaccine. Fantastic, Jamie, and congratulations on uh, medical school, and uh, we really look forward. Uh, I think you'll be a terrific doctor. Uh, Thank another you very much. Ter terrific doctor will be uh, Paul. Paul, would you uh, provide your perspective, building on what Jamie said, of the message to our essential workers, uh, first responders, and educators who are part of this program? Absolutely. So, like Jamie said, <laughs> the uh, uh, it's going to be really effective for um, people that uh, for, for, um, for your friends and family to be, I guess, most influenced by, by you, you, know, you convincing them to receive the vaccine uh, and to spread the message and also to lead by example. So it's incredibly effective if you haven't been vaccinated, but you're, st you're still on the edge, definitely go out there and get your vaccine. That's gonna go a long way in helping convince the people that you care about to also do so. Well, thank you, Paul. I really appreciate it. And Charlie's message uh, to uh, young people you heard in the video, uh, Charlie's receiving a second vaccine and many of his uh, uh, high school student colleagues and, and teammates uh, have, uh, have sought it and we see almost no side effects. And so we really look forward to having everyone participate in this uh, program uh, with us. So the second best, so the first best practice is vaccination. Uh, and the second is, one of our first programs was coming home safe. How do you go from the hot zone at work, the warm zone, which is where you disinfect, and then the, the home, the safe zone? And what we've really uh, learned through this program, which was uh, really, really well received, was social distance and masking, hand hygiene, and high contact surface cleanliness is important. Um, now what we know is that ventilation is absolutely critical. Uh, as we come through the warm zone of disinfecting, and many of our doctors were disinfecting in their garage and having separate rooms, they're now doing just as, they haven't changed their procedures. However, uh, they now can be much more efficient at it, but they're really, really focused on the critical issue of uh, aerosol risk. And we know that the average human being touches their face 24 times in an hour, so that as Dr. Boat says, this isn't zero with contact surfaces it's less, probably far less than what we originally thought. However, the aerosol risk and the risk to our HVAC systems is much, uh, much more important. So these original slides haven't been changed actually a year ago. And we can see in maintaining the safe zone is not only keeping the disinfection stations if you have somebody sick at home or if you are exposed at your job, uh, but maintaining ventilation should be all caps and understanding the latest rules on isolation, quarantine, and care of our seniors, all really important. Now, a recent article, as recent as April 15th came out, this is an excellent article that provided the, the 10 scientific reasons in support of airborne transmission. Now, um, we like to use the term airborne, meaning that it could be large droplets that land close to the person over maybe five microns that land close to the person can be touched or breathed in. But those that are much smaller, smaller than five microns are the ones that can float in the air. So we've seen now long range transmission has been reported in quarantine hotels and settings. Asymptomatic individuals now anywhere from 33 to 60% or 59% the aerosol particles are critically important. Transmission outdoors in well-ventilated uh, areas is now less, which is good. Infections in healthcare settings called nosocomial infections have helped uh, us understand what's going on. For those of you that are interested in drilling down, take a look, read of this. There were three articles that came out at the same time, which were absolutely excellent. 
and they really helped us understand this airborne risk. Uh, anybody that's contemplating carpooling and being in poorly ventilated spaces needs to really read these to understand them. So now we know that what's called surface or fomite transmission is probably less than what we thought it was. Uh, and the guidelines regarding masks uh, were technical uh, and they were hard to understand. But all one needs to really look at is the right side of this graphic and you see fully vaccinated people uh, really in great uh, in great shape regarding masks. On the left is the is the is the high risk. And but anyone uh, who is going into a poorly ventilated space, I believe, should be wearing a mask because the vaccines in the practical world only protect you 90% of the time. You still have a 10% chance of getting severe disease, and severe disease can put you in the hospital and also can cause death. We've seen breakthrough infections uh, with them. So it's really important that we understand the guidelines, read them, and really know we just don't throw away the masks, that, that it's absolutely critical that we keep in, in mind um, what we need to do and where the risk areas are. So we recommend that you read the CDC guidelines and, and follow them closely and understand that just because you're vaccinated or just because your community has low uh, risk doesn't mean you shed the mask. You really need to look at the risk uh, yourself. So as you look at the CDC guidelines, they are continually updated regarding safe activities. And that brings us to the, the, the next critical issue is keeping the family safe. And what we did with this was, um, and the slides are year old and they apply today. You need to look at the threats in your community and then identify the vulnerabilities of your family and then determine what your risk is. You just don't throw down the mask and say, I'm gonna go and operate in the community because everybody else is. So what we did was we said, look, your goal should be to re reduce the, your vulnerability your personal vulnerability and of your family. And you can't do that without kind of assessing what that is. Now, way back then, this was the background infection in Orange County where I live. My family includes a male over 65. I'm 66 on Saturday. My wife is in her 50s. I have a mid-teen who has uh, had cardiac surgery, is vulnerable to hyperimmune reactions. And now I have a grandmother. Uh, we have a grandmother who is now 100 years of age. But this was back then. If you look today at our infection, the daily infection rate in the chart that you see there is much lower. Uh, we're at a lower tier. We're at the minimal tier in California. Uh, we hope that we won't have it uh, move up, but I still have the same vulnerability for my family. So what would I do? I need to, step one, identify each family member, look at the outside threats in the community and the inside threats to your family uh, in your community, so you understand what those are, be able to look at them by age, look at them uh, related to their immune status and the risk for hyperimmune reactions. In my family, we have both. And then uh, be, the step two is really to uh, uh, articulate those by those family members, so then you can put together a family safety plan. And the family safety plan then is something that applies the five R's, and what you do is you take those five R's and say, okay, how can I reduce the vulnerability of my family? Now, your family may not be vulnerable at all, but we do know that Jamie and, and Paul uh, are in high risk and will be in high risk environments. And they're gonna potentially bring home the virus. They may not get sick, but they might bring it home to their family and their family members. They need to look at, well, what behaviors would we, would we maintain? The third step is then develop a family safety plan. Now, we're not going to go through that today. We're on time with our, our program today, uh, but, but we have a 90-minute program on putting a plan together, and we have a 90-minute program on the templates, and you can go back to look at those. Develop your plan, and then plan the flight and fly the plan. Now, Dr. Boats, Chief Adcox, and Charlie and I wrote an article for Campus Safety Magazine that identified the family impact scenarios. You might be ranged from no exposure, no test, or no, uh, uh, and no negative risk to infected requiring ICU and life support and respirator and ECMO, which is uh, the artificial lung. So we recommend you read this. Now, why would you read it today when we have the light at the end of the tunnel and we're reopening? We're not sure we're, we're, we're gonna be free of a variant and there are over 200 epidemics that the WHO tracks per year. And I think we're gonna be up against this now for the rest of our lives of a series of uh, pandemics that will strike 
uh, strike uh, where we are. So as we look at uh, practicing the safety plan, that means that not only do you build it, but you actually need to practice uh, those things. So let's go back to Dr. Boats. Dr. Boats, now as we consider the 10 best practices, first off is vaccines. Are you inspired and excited uh, about the wonderful leaders that we have from some of our top universities and faculty members and alumni who have joined the cause for the Take the Shot uh, campaign? I think it's really exciting to see that so many people across our higher education communities, our scientific communities, our community leaders are so passionate about joining our efforts to spread the word that vaccination is the right thing. Uh, I think it's really encouraging to see that our young college students are energized to promote uh, vaccination among their peers. This is all a good effort and will pay off in the end. So our Coming Home Safe program, which was a full course, emphasized very early in the pandemic, uh, being safe at work, cleaning high contact surfaces, social distancing, and masks. What's your message now that we know so much more about Coming Home Safe? I think we still have to have a great amount of diligence and attention to those public health strategies. Um, perhaps they aren't as uh, important in, in their prominence in our approach during reopening, but they are still very sound uh, practices. Uh, we had a lot of more attention to contact services early on in the pandemic because we did not have enough data to know whether that was a serious mode of transmission. Perhaps it's less, but not zero. But certainly reducing the contact with people by social distancing and by wearing masks, especially in closed spaces where there's poor ventilation or uh, poor clearing of perhaps uh, aerosol material in the, in the air, um, those public health strategies are still very strong. We just need to temper them for the current context. So now as we talk about uh, providing care at home, what happens if someone is, gets COVID uh, now, we, we have not saturated our hospitals now, but Paul will tell you that he had to help build auxiliary hospital beds uh, and, and uh, here at UCI in Orange County. If we were to have a variant that escaped the, the vaccines and could not get vaccines developed rapidly enough, we could be back in the, in, in the place where we have to take care of someone at home who might or should be in the hospital or we might be referring people to be at home because they're at less risk uh, uh, and uh, due to uh, where they live. So it's really important that we uh, look at how would we take care of somebody at home? And this applies uh, to uh, any of the potential uh, pandemics that we might be having or a surge. So we have a 90 minute program that we put together that basically uh, took you through the steps of creating in your home a treatment room that would allow you to, to do exactly what we do with an isolation room in a hospital. And Heather Foster, Chief Adcox, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Boats all helped us uh, with this entire process of what would you have to do if you had to care for someone at home? And uh, this was very beneficial to us uh, to be able to do it. And the work we've done in the care at home has not changed other than, uh, well, I think we're placing more emphasis on the aerosolization of this virus. So um, providing great ventilation, for example, not sharing um, the same uh, living space with those who have the virus rather than um, emphasizing on wiping down surfaces. Dr. Boats, you were a great contributor as were nurse preventionists and others regarding providing care at home. Um, now we may not have to care for as many people at home, but God forbid we would have other surges and other variants that would influence us to have to care people, care for people who have COVID that are COVID positive at home with others. What would you like to add? I think it's really important for us to maintain uh, our vigilance and our plans for caring for those who contract the coronavirus. The vaccines have reduced the spread. They may have reduced the serious uh, consequences of infection, 
fewer people are being hospitalized, fewer people are dying. But the coronavirus is still in our communities. It's still being spread at a low level. And so people who have immunocompromise, people who've not yet completed vaccination, those people are still at risk for getting the same illness that was prevalent earlier on in the pandemic. And so maintaining our strategy for caring for those people at home is still important. So now emergency rescue skills. What do we do if someone is getting sick and we ha and they might be, you might know, not know them very well. They might be roommates at college. They might be uh, at, at a facility where you're working or they might be uh, in your home. What do we do regarding rescue? So we put a whole program together on uh, taking people from knowing how to assess when someone uh, is sick, using pulse oximeters, being able to ask the right questions, looking at the trouble, uh, the, the troublesome signs and symptoms, then how to safely transport them to the hospital. But one of the really important things to recognize is most of the transportation uh, groups uh, that were uh, Uber, Lyft, any of those taxis would not take a sick person from the emergency department home. So being able to then transport home and then be able to uh, undertake what's ab absolutely critical to have what they need for that care at home, including the medications. We put together, um, we have a short video with uh, Dr. Christopher Peabody of UCSF, the five rights of emergency care, which we developed years ago that has applicability today. So the these five rights are ab absolutely critical. Uh, we review them in the videos and in our program, but to briefly cover those is to focus on the right provider. They need, patients need to know to go to the place where their medical records are, bypass the urgent care if you're really sick to get to a major medical center and make sure to make the right choices. The right diagnosis can only be generated with the right history and medical records, care plans, being able to bring medications, imaging studies, and test documentation, absolutely vital. And then for the right treatment, it's important that everybody understand short-term and long-term implications. And when people were at the emergency department, they could not be um, have a family member with them. And being able to have a charged phone, as simple as having a charged phone in the parking lot, very, very critical when you bring a loved one uh, to uh, the emergency department. And then the right discharge. This is one of the most important issues uh, brought up by Dr. Peabody, which is to make sure to understand the return precautions. When we do return for care. Some people think, well, that's all they could do for me. I'm getting sicker, so I don't go back. So absolutely critical that we understand these techniques and really understand what we might do to help a family member uh, who, who might be ill. Very, very important. And then the right follow-up uh, is after you get better, making sure that you have the continuity of care with your, pri your primary caregivers so that there's the handoff. So Dr. Boats, now as we think about um, recognizing someone at home who may have severe disease, who we must get to the emergency department and then perhaps have to then bring home from the emergency department. What would you like to add that we now know that maybe we didn't know over a year ago about emergency care, identifying people that we need to bring to the hospital? Well, I know it's very uh, favorable that the numbers are falling in our communities but there are still going to be people who contract the coronavirus and are going to have symptoms that are beyond that which can be managed safely at home. Our hospitals have not really changed their stance on providing a protected environment for the care of patients with and without COVID disease. And so we still have to have a strategy for safely interacting with the emergency department when needed so that your loved one can get the most appropriate care, but in a different way than hospitals have traditionally operated. We still have limited visitation. We still have cohorting of people who are at risk for the coronavirus pending testing results, or those who have tested positive for the COVID uh, virus. And so having a plan for recognizing the person who can no longer be managed at home, and having a plan for moving them safely to uh, an emergency room or a healthcare provider is still part of our critical family plan. 
So Dr. Boats, you uh, are a critical care doctor and actually teach uh, young doctors and doctors in training about critical care. Now with more than a year under our belt, what advice do you have to family members who may unfortunately have a family member with COVID who goes into the ICU now that we've learned so much more? I think we're very fortunate that we are moving into a phase of this pandemic where fewer people need hospitalization and fewer people are requiring ICU level care. But again, that's not zero. There are still people that have respiratory symptoms that cause significant hypoxemia or low oxygen levels that require ICU level care. And so having an understanding of what sort of management, what sort of technology, what sort of strategies we have for managing those patients will go a long way to help families understand what's going on with their loved one and what things may you know, occur in the next 24 hours or 48 hours or days ahead. So understanding what happens in an ICU is critical because most of the people who require ICU level care with COVID often require life support measures during their ICU stay. So now, um, long haul disease. What about the, the long haul conditions that are absolutely critical? We know that these are very, very common, much more common than we ever thought. Uh, I'm a real, um, I, 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 I'm a real fan of Francis Collins, Dr. Francis Collins of the, uh, the NIH. And uh, in a recent program at the end of April, uh, this quote is, could not be more powerful. I can't overstate how serious the issue is for the health of the nation. Uh, the estimate based on studies showing roughly 10% of people who get COVID could have long haul uh, COVID-19 and long-term course may be un, uh, uncertain. And we know there are a number of papers where it may be estimated to be even greater. Multi-system inflammatory disease, which can harm, um, harm patients. And it may be that you might have a, a, mild, uh, a mild case of COVID and then get a very serious long haul uh, issue with fatigue, brain fog, um, the lungs, uh, as it infiltrates in the lungs with persistent requirements for oxygen. Um, depression, uh, palpitations uh, and heart disease, infl inflammation of the lining of the heart, uh, blood clots, chronic kidney disease, even hair loss. And so these are, these are absolutely serious. No one should want to have these. And um, when we are talking to those loved ones or friends that are reluctant to get vaccinated, they really need to know how common this is and that and you don't have to get a severe case of COVID to then get this long haul condition that can strike so many of our of our organ systems, which are absolutely critical. We highly recommend a 60 minutes program on long haul disease with two athletes, two women that were athletes, um, that were marathon runners and trainers who actually were just totally debilitated and not after se a severe disease. They're one of the best, one of the best 60 minute programs that I've seen. And so uh, really, really critical for us to, to understand this. Dr. Boats, we now know so much more about long haul disease and that we don't want to have it and that it can really have uh, some serious ramifications on one's future. What would you like to add regarding long haul disease and recovery through that period of time when people have to get back to normal and it take, may take many months? I think we've learned a tremendous amount about those people that have persistent symptoms after COVID infection. We call that long COVID or long haul disease. But what that means is there are ongoing signs and symptoms of inflammation and organ dysfunction in people who have been infected with COVID. I think one of the things we've learned that's most important is that the people who get long haul disease aren't necessarily the people who have required ICU care. They can have a relatively mild case of COVID and not require hospitalization but still have a long lingering uh, period of debilitation from the effects of the COVID infection. So as we think about these very serious ramifications uh, of these uh, illnesses, and we think about what we would like to accomplish as we go forward, it, it, uh, we, we really need to think about the four Ps at the new normal, which is how do we implement an approach? Let's say we, we get through this, uh, this uh, current phase, we might have 
outbreaks, hopefully uh, that we won't have uh, another COVID surge with variants. Uh, and even if we didn't, how would we then start to operate at the new normal and uh, knowing that there, this virus still may be in our community? And so what we've done is we said, look, uh, let's go back uh, for, uh, looking out, uh, looking over the last year. And if we look at, at the areas that we've been focusing on over the last, uh, last year, we actually started with something general, but then we moved to coming home safe. We move up into an, you know, the best prevention right now is the vaccines and understanding the variants and the road to victory. Um, knowing how to assess your family and your own risks so that you can define your behavior, not by what your politicians say locally, but what you know about the science and make the, and turn the science into safety. Putting together, and it could be the most simple plan or a complex plan, and being able to put together a plan, and we've provided a lot of really great material that really has not changed the providing care at home hasn't changed at all. The hospitals have not changed what they're doing uh, in terms of isolation rooms. The emergency departments have learned so much more about aerosol risk, but going to and coming back from the emergency department, really super important highlights. And then when people are in the ICU, God forbid that you have a family member that still had to go to the ICU. But if you have somebody who's vulnerable, um, a severe disease, a certain percentage are gonna go to the ICU and a certain percentage are going to die really big, uh, uh, big issue for those of us that are trying to convince others to get vaccinated and look at our, our for, go forward plan is long haul disease. This is nothing a young person. I wouldn't want my son who is a competitive surfer and, and who is aspiring student to go through brain fog and then to go through unsteadiness and not be able to compete. Uh, and so as we look at the 10 best practices and then apply them to uh, what we're doing in the new normal, I think it's really, really important important that we all recognize how vital uh, the issues uh, are going to be as, as, we, as we move forward. And Dr. Boats, finally, as we think about operating at the new normal, we developed the 4P model of prevention and preparedness and protection when a bad event occurs or uh, what we call boom that might occur and performance improvement and having that be a cycle and a series of loops where we're learning to practice the four Ps. What would you like to share with us as we think about this as one of our closing practices and what we must do as we operate at that new normal after this wave of COVID? I think the four Ps are a critical strategy for operationalizing our response to COVID disease in our community. Just like the five Rs define our strategy for preparing for and responding to COVID disease in our family unit and in our community, using the four Ps as a strategy for operationalizing our approach and our execution of things that need to happen when someone has COVID is so important. And I think the most important is to close the loop with a performance improvement strategy to take what we've learned over time and adjust how we are responding to COVID disease in an ongoing fashion. For instance, as we have moved from uh, the last surge of COVID disease in our communities into a more stable state, perhaps leading to uh, more reopening, we still have to pay attention to things that are happening and feed them back into our family plan, into our strategies for care at home or emergency care. All of those things can be modified based on what we've learned about this disease over time, especially in this very, very significant pandemic. Um, on the reopening, as communities uh, are excitedly reopening, I think it's important that we take the smart approach to this. Um, a lot of us are ready to ditch the mosques and move on, but as I had a conversation with a community member, you know, um, you wouldn't want your surgeon to walk into your oper operating room without a mask and gloves and without washing his hands. These, these practices that healthcare workers have been abiding by have been proven effective to have positive outcomes for our patients. This is no different for the community members in the pandemic. So as we start shedding the masks, uh, uh, good choice of words there, um, we wanna be careful that we're not shedding virus, right? So I think as we, as we step out into the, into the new normal, um, I like how people are saying that now, um, that we're just careful about it and cautious about it. 
Well, Dr. Boats, uh, thank you so very much for your wonderful contributions to this program now over a year and uh, many, many uh, courses that we now are combining to, to look at reopening. And uh, we're so grateful that you've been able to off offer this expertise to the audience. Thanks very much. It's been my pleasure to participate in this very important effort. And I hope that our communities have learned about the COVID disease and are using our five R's and the four P's to make it safer for themselves, for their family members and the community around them. So now, uh, as we wrap up and we'll go back to uh, Jamie and to Paul and to uh, Jennifer Dingman for her reaction as now, not as just the voice of the patient, but uh, representing the community. We, we have these 12 courses, they're all 90 minutes. Uh, we'll now, as we head, hopefully, to the light at the end of the tunnel, um, we, we are going to curate them and make them uh, more and more appropriate for uh, where we are today as we want to practice the four Ps at the new normal. Um, uh, I'd like to go back to uh, Chief Adcox first and ask Chief Adcox to now kind of highlight areas that you think are important from your perspective. And you're, you're kind of where the three hats and uh, the, the triple threat, uh, Bill, you're, a, you're a, a threat safety scientist, you represent law enforcement and first responders, but you're also at a major medical center and know an awful lot about the clinical care that's delivered and are, you're protecting and helping your world-class uh, clinicians at the world's uh, foremost uh, cancer center. Uh, Bill, your thoughts. Well, thank you. And uh, everyone that's presented and all the information that's come out today, uh, just so valuable and uh, so important that everybody uh, lent their expertise and their time. Um, one of the things I did want to say is, is that uh, apart from what Dr. Boat says, a uh, part of what he said was he talked about maintaining vigilance and, and maintaining our plans. And those, those things are very critical for us to do, all of us, whether you're a first responder or whether you're wearing whatever hat we are wearing. Um, and I think, I think the, the thing for all of us to remember is that uh, when we talk about these principles and these practices and we talk about the coronavirus, the thing to remember is, is that each and every one of those practices and, and almost across the board can be utilized in a universal fashion throughout our lives and throughout emergencies and, and other viruses and other things that are going to be happening. So it's not just not just that we package in a coronavirus, which is the which is the is the threat that's with us now and likely a lifetime and beyond, uh, but it is going to help us in, in virtually all walks of life, and it helps us as we we develop safety plans, as we develop emergency plans, and in our our arena here in in the in the Gulf Coast region, you're dealing with hurricanes on a regular basis and in other cr critical fashions, and so this stuff dovetails real real good. And the last thing I like to say is is these programs and this data and this information for everybody that's on the webinar, for everybody that's going to see the webinar in the future and everybody that's going to avail themselves to these great resources, it's going to allow us as a society, as a, as a community, a community of practice, it's going to allow us to, to focus on facts and, and, and appropriate caution and not on fear and, and ignorance and not doing the things that we should be doing. And it, it allows us to allow us, us to have fear as a friend and not as a foe. It allows us to be able to pay attention. So you, you're going to get all the facts. You're going to be understand what are the appropriate cautionary things that you can do, how you can be vigilant, but still live your life, still have quality in your life and still save the lives of your family members and the rest of the community. So uh, I think it's fabulous. And thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Well, thank you, Bill, and uh, yeah, we really appreciate uh, uh, it. We'll continue to, up, to update uh, where we are. I'd like to go to, to Jennifer and give Jennifer a chance to comment uh, on uh, what you've seen, Jennifer, and then we'll come back to you when we close, but uh, we'll go to Jennifer, then Jamie, uh, and then Paul. Jennifer, are you muted? Uh, let's go to uh, Jamie. Uh, Jamie, I see that you're muted. Uh, Jamie, your comments, uh, your thoughts uh, regarding what we've uh, what we've been uh, what we've been reviewing. 
I think it's really important information for everybody to learn. Um, you know, we're in a good place in the pandemic and hopefully it will continue to improve, but um, we know pandemics are an international phenomenon. So we have to be re remain vigilant. We hope that the variant won't come and um, 10 best practices for reopening are just really important for your own health and the health of society as a whole. What's your message, Jamie, to other college students? Uh, you're now moved to your advanced degree and probably moved to more advanced degrees as you specialize. Do uh, you have any special message for college and high school students? Uh, well, specifically in the time that we're in, get the vaccine if you haven't gotten it already. Uh, I think, again, I'll reiterate myself that I think of the 10 reopening practices, getting the vaccine is probably the single easiest and maybe the most impactful of the 10 reopening practices. So I would really, really, really encourage all of you, but specifically the college students who we all really want to go out and have a social life again, please get the vaccine. Great. Thank you. So, Paul, uh, your your summary thoughts on things that you think you would like to underscore. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's pretty to, to you know, go on the news or go on social media and see how see and, and, and kind of think that we're basically done with the pandemic. Fortunately, that's not entirely the case. It's definitely not the case. We don't know what these variants in other countries will possibly be doing. We don't know what. Um, uh, you know, what, how the, how infections might progress within our communities now, uh, given that the vaccines aren't completely uh, capable of making us immune to the virus, but they, they are pretty effective. What we do know is the effectiveness of all the practices that, we, that we've been working on since day one, face masking, social distancing, and, and just making the best decisions based on your threat profile, people around you, people in your household, uh, in your environment, and, and the prevalence in your community. Uh, to make the best decisions for you and for the people you care about. So Paul and Jamie, I'll just come back to both of you and just say, uh, state one of the questions and uh, please go into chat anyone. Uh, and uh, if you watch this program, the majority of people will watch it recorded. Uh, we'll have a link for you to submit questions on the website. People are inundated right now with webinars. It's a tough time of the year, but we know that there are a lot of leaders that are watching today that we're, we'll share this with their constituents that we would love to be able to help answer questions and then uh, re-refer you to our our program next month and we'll answer questions for that. But as I go back to you, Jamie, and uh, both you, uh, Paul, as we talk about why do I mask? Why should I mask um, after I've been vaccinated uh, and uh, why is that important? And I think it's really key that people understand that, uh, that the vaccine only prevents severe disease and at the front line in, a, in millions of people, the effectiveness drops to about 90%. So you're gonna have about a 10% rate of people that will get infected with severe disease. And severe disease can lead to long-term problems as well as mild disease. And the other issue that a lot of people don't realize is that you can harbor the, the virus in your nasopharynx and in your body, uh, not get any symptoms and virus, and that's how the variants uh, uh, continue to uh, develop. So maybe Paul, because I see you're on, uh, your camera's on you right now. Uh, why should we vac Why should we wear masks after we're vaccinated in a community where we've still got a lot of infection? Well, for the, the exact same reason why they've worked so effectively in the first place. Um, by, by keeping the barrier you know, over yourself, um, whether you're, you're infected or not, it acts as a safeguard to prevent you from spreading it to others, even you know, potentially if you are asymptomatic, such that you know, you're not showing any symptoms, um, you might not even feel sick at all, but you're still capable of infecting others. That piece of cloth is gonna be the, the best uh, way for you to, to prevent from transmitting it uh, to other people. Thank you. And Jamie, you have done a lot of work with us on the mask uh, articles we're writing, updating the mask uh, videos. Uh, uh, do you want to uh, help us understand maybe a little bit more detail about what we know uh, about how effective these masks are? I'm, I'm just thinking of the Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier and uh, that where a lot of the spread information in the past, you and I were both surprised to find out that a lot of the distance recommendations and spread recommendations were built on studies that were 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, so we know that um, aerosol transmission is incredibly important. And one thing that I learned about masks is actually, you know, when you shed the virus, you're actually not shedding individual viruses, which are 
unbelievably tiny. You're shedding the virus encapsulated a little glob of mucus. And it's the mask that has the fibers that are actually electrostatically charged that catch the, those mucus particles. So just because um, the virus is in a different phase of the pandemic or whatever, masks continue to be effective and they will always be actually an effective tool against any respiratory virus. And we know also that um, asymptomatic spread is one of the major drivers of this virus. So um, we do need to be aware of asymptomatic transmission. Right. So for anybody who's traveling and flying, just remember, if you go into uh, the head in uh, the bathroom on the plane that is poorly ventilated or stand on a jetway close to other people that is poorly ventilated, uh, the cross pollination of air and sharing air, it, you know, that's why we came up with the principle of don't share air. If you're going into an environment where the air turnover is very low, uh, that's where I would want to wear a mask. Uh, and uh, I, I think people need to kind of harness the science and not just throw away the mask or wear the mask all the time, but actually understand a little bit more about the science. So Jamie, I just want to thank you for your contribution uh, to the program. Paul, you as well, and on behalf of our community in Orange County for your, your steadfast work. Here's a pre-med student. There you are building auxiliary hospital beds. Uh, you, you really won our heart when you did that, Paul. You're one of our heroes for doing that. And uh, I'd like to come back to uh, Chief Adcox for any final words, and then we'll go to you, uh, Jennifer. Oh, thank you. It's what a, what a lively discussion and, and super, super stuff that we're talking about. The only thing I can say is, 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 is to encourage everyone to please uh, publicize where the site is so that everybody can get this information. Help us help others and, and bring everybody into the community of practice. Uh, just just such a robust uh, amount of information. And last uh, and not least, uh, Dr. Denham, thank you so very much for putting these uh, webinars on and supporting this and making it happen. Uh, none of this is ever going to be possible without you. And I know just how much sacrifice you've had to make to have this happen. And all of us that uh, in, in this program here deeply appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chief, and thanks for your contribution. And uh, the last word will be with Jennifer Dingman. Jennifer, what would you like to share? And then I just want, and then I'll have a, some concluding comments because this program will be used for continuing education for doctors, nurses, uh, and also for cor corporations. And I'll have a, a final couple of words there. But the final content word for the day, as always, uh, Jennifer, thank you again for all you've done in patient safety and quality and for being our, our, our voice of the patient through this more than a year of, uh, of programs. Thank you, Dr. Denham. Excellent discussion. And I just want to echo what Chief Adcock said. It's so important to share this information with your family, friends, and colleagues. Go to the videos and, and watch all of them, share them widely. Um, I just want to thank our speakers for all the good that you're doing and everything that's happening right now. It's I'm very, very optimistic and excited for the future. And, and Dr. Denham, I can't thank you enough for the educational information that you've put out to help people. I'm sure you've saved so many lives and helped make people make really good decisions through your work. So God bless everyone here and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Denham. Great, Jennifer. So this program it was built actually uh, at, to uh, be able to deliver continuing education for law enforcement, for clinical specialties, as well as for uh, nursing and allied healthcare, and also for corporate health systems. And we truly believe that every, uh, every organization needs to have a health security officer. And we look forward to putting a lot of the framework that you have found today uh, uh, into that curriculum. And so I just wanna thank everyone and those that were recorded uh, today, as well as those that are live. And uh, as we always say, fight the good fight, finish the race and keep the faith. That's our motto and everyone can be a patient and everyone can be a caregiver. Thank you all and we'll see you next month.